Welcome back, Warriors. Kwe Tanse Sego Ani Buju. Kwe Ninda Luizi Pam Palmeter. And I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, but at the same time, revitalizing our cultures, traditions, practices, laws, and governing structures. But it's also about living, asserting, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. Our clans, houses, villages, communities, and nations all have different customs, and the same goes for Native peoples all over the world in sovereign Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand, or South America. But there's also really critical commonalities, like the importance of women as life givers, elders as teachers, and warriors as critical protectors and defenders of our nation. Today, we get to talk to someone who has dedicated his life to living a warrior life, not only in defense of our rights as Native peoples, but also in sharing his knowledge with all of our Native brothers and sisters all over the world with critical things like survival skills. Sakej Ward is a well-known grassroots warrior, and I'm honored to say that we're actually from the same nation. He represents a unique blend of traditional Mi'kmaq knowledge, military training, graduate education, and community-based experience, and his work hasn't gone unnoticed. He won the National Aboriginal Achievement Foundation for all of his work protecting Indigenous peoples, our freedoms, and our territories and he continues to help educate the rest of us on what it actually means to be a warrior and pride in being a warrior. And I am so thankful that I get to talk to him today. Welcome to the show, Sakaj. Thanks for having me, appreciate that. I really, really appreciate it. We're all really lucky to hear from you. And I'm wondering if you would like to introduce yourself in the way that you like to do it. Sure, sure. So, um, we're going to get into bad state quick. Uh, my name is Sanj. I'm Mi'kmaq, and I belong to a homeland called Mi'kmaq. I'm from a community called Eskinobich, and a lot of people may remember that as Burn Church First Nation. Um, I'm what uh, Mi'kmaq people refer to as smogness. That's the word we use for warrior, um, although that word can be contested in so many different ways, and I'm sure we'll get a chance to see that. I'm also um which is through the Shinabi people, it is Wolf Clan, where I was adopted into the Digital Warrior Society from my mother out there. Um, I think what I want to do we could take a moment is not just tell you who I am, but let me tell you a little bit about how I got here, a little bit about my background, you can understand that story there. So um growing up in Micmac territory. I knew from a very young age that uh, I wanted to do something. At the time, I didn't have a word for it, but it was soldier-like. And this is, you know, we're talking about the early 80s. Uh, we didn't see much way in the way of like um, where's your son's back. Mm -hmm. And I remember being a teenager and having discussions with my friends saying, you know, if there was a Mi'kmaq army, I would join that. Yeah. I want to find a way to, to find an outlet for what we term now as a warrior spirit. We just didn't have the, the language for this. Right? So, I didn't see it then. Uh, we didn't see this idea of a, a Mi'kmaq army at the time of Mi'kmaq forces. And being deeply assimilated, uh, I didn't think like that. You know, just like the rest of our people, right from birth, we are faced with this pressure of assimilation. And I grew up right outside of Boston in my young years. So I grew up in Massachusetts, very much an urban environment. I was deeply assimilated. So when it came time to try to satisfy this side to me that was really like a desire. I had like a calling for this regimented lifestyle, very military kind of lifestyle. I had my oldest brother who was getting me into martial arts at a young age, probably around seven. Uh, another one of my brothers are already in the military. So that was the direction I was going to go. And I felt like, you know, this is it. I can't see anything else in my life. So at the age of 17, while still in high school, I joined the Canadian militia. And that's just a part-time military organization, right? They're like a, kind of like a reserve unit. Um, but just more limited, right? And I served in that, that militia up until I graduated. The day after graduation, I hitchhiked back down to the States. I felt that the Canadian militia was way too soft for me. And, you know, at the time, not being politically um, astute at all, especially around colonization, um, all I thought about is my desire to go prove myself a man by going to war. 
And I thought, well, who better than join the Americans? They go to war with everybody, right? So I go down there and I spent five years with them. Uh, my desire was to go into special forces and focus on the concepts of, of uh, guerrilla war. Now, I was married at the time. I was married at a very young age and had children. Uh, so, you know, we're talking, I was still a teenager. And my ex-wife, or wife at the time, uh, didn't like the idea of me going to the special forces. And she had felt I'd be gone too long. It's true. I'd been gone about 10 months out of the year. Right? Uh, so we compromised. And I had joined an elite unit. I was with the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, I ran special teams. They're reconnaissance teams. They go behind enemy lines, really small four-man teams. You did work back there. And I'd been through a special forces uh, infantry leader uh, school. And by the time I left the military, I was running my own teams, and I was a sergeant. But then I left. And that's when I started changing. I didn't even realize my life was about to start shifting. And I immediately decided I was going to go to university. I wanted to get a bachelor's degree. And it didn't matter what it was in because I was just trying to get back into that same world again. I wanted to go with and um, get into the U.S.'s drug enforcement unions. I'd grown up watching how much devastation was created by drugs in our community. And I had this real hate for drugs. So I wanted to get into drug enforcement. But it was just as I was starting university where the first seed of decolonization kind of crept into my life. And I didn't recognize it at the time. My uncle had asked me to come in and check on some. He was already part of the McMahon Forest Society. And they were in um, just outside of Eel Ground uh, First Nation. And they were protecting a, really what amounts to is a creek. It was a very small river uh, where a little bit of fishing was going on. But Fisheries and Oceans was trying to stop the community. So the worst society went in there, they went to help out the community. And then he asked me, he said, listen, you got all that military experience, why don't you come in and um, provide some kind of recommendations? And I said, sure. And I went in and I, I did the best I could. I did three hours of assessment recommendations. I really wanted to you know, do what I could. This is my uncle asking me. Um, these are my people, people from my community. And I really didn't want to help out as best. But it was when I was done with that assessment, that I stepped out to allow them to discuss what they wanted to discuss. And I look over and I could see um, across the line was their RCMP. And they're set up in an opposition to this. And that's what caused me to think, well, wait a minute now, just months ago, having been in the military, metaphorically, I would have been on the other side of that line. Why am I on the Mi'kmaq side now? What is the real nature of the state and Mi'kmaq people? And that planted a nice little seed of doubt if that's what started to attack that worldview that had that assimilated worldview, it took years of deconstructing. It took years of really working at this, but it was the necessary seed I needed. So when I got into university, that's when things really shifted. And it wasn't because of university. It was because of that seed that caused me to start to kind of go on this path all on my own. And what started as a degree in political science with a specialization in international relations now gained an indigenous focus. So I wrote my thesis on indigenous self-determination, but the department didn't want me to. They had said, that's not international relations, that's domestic politics. And I laughed and I said, no, indigenous nations are nations. And this is a fight around self-determination. So they kind of very hesitantly said, all right, but in the first chapter, you have to prove that this is really indigenous, I mean, international relations. And I did, and it, you know, the, the thesis went through, um, they accepted it. And it was, for me, it was my first real step in taking a stand towards self determination. So, shortly after um, getting my bachelor's degree, is when I got into the community around the fight, around the Supreme Court martial decision and fishery mm -hmm. fights. And that was maybe, I don't even think it was a year after getting my bachelor's degree, I got into that fight. And in that fight, um, I recognized a lot of different approaches we could use in terms of strategy. And one obviously is the international. Now I see this differently than most. Most people see the idea of a strategy around appealing to United Nations and asking for help. But if you really understand the nature of nation states, you understand international relations, you understand the United Nations is really just a body of nation states upholding laws in nation states. The very places that are making laws to take away our resources, take away our lands and to oppress our people, right? But I seen it more as a, an obstruction. I seen it more as a way of feeding into the media operations. So I managed to go to United Nations um, 
my older brother was instrumental in that. He said, listen, take my credit card, go. Because this wasn't funded by <laughs> any of the communities or nothing like that. Um, he said, go do what you got to do. And then I went and I spoke to United Nations. And I, I had mentioned that we're trying to protect the traditional fisheries. And in doing so, the, the Canadian state wants to impose colonial law, which is completely illegitimate in our territories. And myself and other warriors um, are not gonna allow that. We're gonna stand for our people and allow them to practice their way of culture and fishing. And I think it took only 48 hours after I got back from the UN and it already degraded into conflict. We already had raids from the government. We, um, we had put up um, some barriers to stop the police from coming in, trying to arrest some of our people. And then what we seen from there was two years of fighting on the water over on the fisheries. Right? So my identity was first constructed as this colonial soldier, first with the Canadian military, then later with the American military. But really, I didn't become human, a Mi'kmaq person. Um, until I was like in my 20s. What I mean by that is I didn't identify with the ideas of being indigenous in our way. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think about the idea of warrior until then. So really, I, I gotta thank my uncle for introducing me to that. Uh, uh, it was a lifestyle or, or a way of life that completely shifted and changed everything. All my pursuits, all my goals completely were abandoned. I couldn't think of the thought of working for the colonizer, that state no more. And now I've taken all the skills, uh, experiences, lessons learned, failures, and brought them to this side of the fight. And said, how do we take these things and use them to empower people so that we'll have resistance strategies against colonialism? Well, that's incredible. Um, it, and it really shows a journey that you know, you think about in the old days, like pre-contact, all the ways in which our, you know, boys and girls went on their different journeys and the ways in which they were mentored, you know, towards those journeys and learned about all of the values and the mindset and the worldviews and, you know, all of the belief systems around, you know, charting these paths and all of the really important roles that we play within our nations. And, the, you know, then you have colonization that aside from just teaching us we're all, you know, savages and heathens and we're no good and, and all of that stuff, just really does everything they can to separate our kids from the people who would teach us these roles you know even yeah. just the basic concept of what it means to be a warrior and you know just basically put a blanket on all of that and so trying to get all that back i mean that just didn't happen overnight for you i mean this is I something try. that clearly to you you kind of had to work through i mean what's what do you think was your biggest influence? Was it your uncle or was it just all of these seeds kind of germinating? For sure, it was definitely my uncle creating a situation that planted that seed. Um, but also, you know, there was a lot of other influences, family for one, community for another. Um, and I think deep down, we always have a desire to belong to our land, to belong to our people, but we don't know how to do that no more. We've lost the teachings around how to connect and how to belong in, in, in the indigenous way that we used to. And I think we all have that. So that part of that was a driving force. But also, deep down inside, and I, I imagine this is part of what most warriors feel, is a deep-seated feeling of a sense of justice. Mm -hmm. So the more I identified the injustices of colonial history, the more angered, the more uh, driven, I became. So now I, I'm, I'm typically a stubborn person. So now my stubbornness that used to serve the state got flipped around. So my stubbornness became, I want to see justice for my people. I want to see our people experience freedom again someday. I want to see our nations rise again. And that being the case, I just completely, completely decided this is, you know, this is the way of life I need to pursue that will yield that kind of goal and just applied my stubborn attitude right to it. Well, and look at, I mean, look at the difference in, you know, you look at all these nation states um, and, you know, they have soldiers or they have law enforcement, they have all of these different kinds of, you know, security forces, and they're upheld as, you know, the heroes of their society, you know, they're, um, 
They're looked at as very important people in society. And what have they done to our warriors? They have outlawed them, criminalized them, uh, badmouthed them, monitored and surveilled them, and really portrayed them and painted, you know, all these native warriors out to be bad guys, that they're just like radicals. They're just the criminal element. They're not the good yeah. Indians. They're the bad Indians that you, you should look out for. And you know what I'm, what I'm trying to do in this podcast and, and other work is actually talk to people on the ground so that people hear from the voices so that they hear from us what it means to be a warrior. And I guess, yeah. you know, my, my basic question to you is, you know, what is a warrior? That is so tough to answer. And, and the reason I say that is um, we're so disconnected yeah. from the worldview that supports the concept of war. And then we're using language, obviously the word warrior is English. Yeah. We're using that to try to describe what it means. And I think right off the bat, when we say warrior, images conjure up in our head. Uh, we think of maybe like a European knight, maybe a mm -hmm. Japanese samurai. Uh, we have these other concepts of warrior, right? That don't exactly fit what we discuss when we talk about warrior, right? So if you look at the indigenous language, languages, um, so what our people would say smugs, and I've heard it described many different ways, but one of the ways I heard that described, not a direct translation, but a description of that role was shield bearer, as a meant protector. Um, and if you look at many indigenous nations, their idea of warrior was very much the same thing, a protector, a defender, right? So we can understand from that beginning, but right from our language, that we're talking about a role of protecting. We start to ask, well, where does that come from? Like, what are you protecting? Are you protecting somebody's wealth, like in capitalist society? Are you protecting um, a government, like in a, a nation state, you know, again, a Western concept? Um, or are you protecting something else? And I think what we do to understand this role is we have to go way back. And when I say that, I mean, we gotta go back to the beginning. Indigenous people, now I can't speak for every nation, but almost every single nation I've visited between here down to Central America, um, they have a very common or at least kind of parallel understanding of what we usually call the original instructions or sacred instructions. And what we mean by that are the original teachings we were given on how to live with our land in a good way. And when we first became people, we were taught how do you live with the land where you're not going to destroy it? How do you take care of the life of that land so that it's going to be just as bountiful for the next seven generations, where they will take up that, that responsibility and ensure it goes on to the next seven generations? So there is a point to that where we understand that taking care of that, the managing, the stewardship of that land also includes the protection of it. How can I hand over that land, the conditions of that land, for the next seven generations if I can't protect it from damage? I can't protect it from somebody invading it. Um, if I can't fulfill the role of protector of that land, then I'm not fulfilling those sacred uh, responsibilities, those obligations we have with uh, this connection to uh, creation. So warrior goes back as far as that. It goes back to the point of how we, uh, how we, had, we were assigned a responsibility to take care of the land. But that includes us. We, you know, we got to not look at the world through this very Western view that's very mm -hmm. Aristotelian, Cartesian, the idea of compartmentalizing and everything. And then we start the impression that humans are separate from territory, or humans are separate from nature. And that's not the case. Uh, so when you talk about protection of the territories, we're talking about, you know, protection of our people too. Um, and most of the time that means maintaining relationships. Now I can speak from the Mi'kmaq side. So not all indigenous mm -hmm. nations view it this way. But from the Mi'kmaq side, um, warriors are expected to uphold justice. So what the, the, the foundation of the justice that we, we had practiced was around relationships, proper relationships with each other, proper relationships with the land. So one of the things that's drawn from this is if you have the responsibility of protecting justice, then you can't turn a blind eye to injustice. So you're not allowed to forgive. Forgiveness creates a vacuum creates a place where injustices can happen. So as warriors, you had to seek resolution. Now that doesn't mean you went out with a chip on your shoulder and you started to fight every chance you got. Mm -hmm. It was the opposite. You practiced a lot of diplomatic skills. You practiced a lot of strategy. How do you resolve a situation without it becoming degrading and making a relationship even worse? So we were in a um, potential conflict with another indigenous nation. 
more than likely, we're going to find ways to make that work. We'll present our case. We'll say, listen, here's where we believe an injustice happened. How do we resolve this? And most times, those are always resolved with ceremonies around reconciliation. Now, every once in a while, they weren't just two opposing views on to, whatever the situation might have been. And in this case, that's when the warrior could step forward and to maintain or uphold the justice of their people, they had to be able to enforce that. And that's where that role of protector and defender, what we think of typically as warrior, the person that goes to the mm -hmm. battlefield, that's where that comes from. Right? So we have to recognize that we have a sacred responsibility that is around protecting land and upholding proper relationships that come from our relationship with the land and with other people and with other nations. And we have to find ways to ensure that that warrior can uphold that, that conditions that create justice. That's part of what we do. Um, but in order to do that, we have to recognize that that role requires basically a lifetime of commitment. What do I mean by that? We, we read general way, we refer to this as warrior arts. And it means all the skill sets, all the trainings, all the teachings, like ceremonial teachings, um, that you need to be this person. And to do that, it is a lifetime. It's a huge pursuit because you're doing everything from learning simple skills around, say, self-defense and the hand combat, all the way up to um, uses of weaponry, and further on into ideas around tactics and strategy. You have to learn politics. You have to learn history. You have to learn uh, culture. And when I talk about strategies, it's just not these idea of military strategies and guerrilla strategies. You have to know strategies that are are offered on a wide spectrum. Everything from non-violent, even legal strategies, all the way up to what uh, the Western world referred to as um, low intensity conflict. And you have to know these spectrum of strategies because every situation you go into will be different. You don't know where you're gonna draw pieces of strategy from. So one of the things that we do in, in a modern sense of, of warrior is we develop a lot of, um, devote a lot of time to learning tactics and strategy. Mm -hmm. That way we become better. What we're trying to seek to do in a way is you want to spend your life trying to become a sacred weapon. You want to be both sacred and strategic. We don't have numbers. We don't have resources. But what we can have is strategy. And I believe there's a Japanese proverb that said, strength is overcome by strategy. So we have to be good strategists. So warriors long ago, as these protectors, had defined our role. As modern warriors, we're seeking ways and strategies and means and tactics to fulfill those same responsibilities we had as lands, uh, back to our homelands. So we are not at all trying to shape or change that concept of warrior. I am honestly hoping that when my time is done and I go to pass, I can say I live my life in such a way that ancestral warriors would recognize. I would say, yes, that's what we meant when we said warrior. That's what it meant to go and protect your land and protect your people. And I want to try to maintain the consistency of that. Because so much of that it has been hijacked by the colonizer. And they take away our people and they become cops or, or, or soldiers. Uh, so much of it has been hybridized uh, with the introduction of other social kind of ideologies. Mm -hmm. um, and so much has been lost just by way of genocide and assimilation. So how do we rebuild that? How do we bring that back? And that's part of the role of Warrior too. is we are starting from scratch all over again. We are trying to rebuild the meaning of Warrior. We're trying to rebuild what are the proper teachings, what are the ceremonies and rituals? What is the subculture that comes with being that Warrior? And what does it mean to be that person? As well as all the skill sets, tactics, and strategies. So when I say it takes a lifetime, that's what I'm referring to. It's, it's more than simply, can I get out there and can I fight? It's way more than that. It's a lifetime of devotion to rebuilding these skill sets. Well, I'm so glad that you said that because in my, you know, talking to different people, whether it be elders or um, warriors on the ground who are members of warrior societies, um, it's... It's, I hear the exact opposite of what government or society has told us about warriors. I mean, when I talk to some of the Haudenosaunee people who are mm -hmm. members of the warrior society, the first words out of their mouths are love and peace. 
and the great law of peace and how to maintain peace in their territories and protect their peoples, which is literally the opposite of, you know, the lies that are being told to us, the vilification of our people, yes. the criminalization of our people. And to me, that's so profound. So when I have like Haudenosaunee people uh, on talking about that, you literally feel the love and the compassion and the lifelong commitment like you're talking about to the values and the morals of protecting their people, knowing that they may also be criminalized, they may be vilified, uh, they even by some of their own people because of the impact of colonization. And, you know, something that was really profound to me because I, I didn't understand warriors or warrior spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't really start thinking about warriorism until I was like 19, you know, here I was bartending in a bar and the um, siege at Gunasatage happened and the military rolls in and you see all these images on the media of like, you know, at first it was police, but then it's literally tanks and soldiers, you know, ar heavily armed soldiers rolling in. And that was really, really frightening to me, the fact that that could happen to us. But you know what gave me light and hope in that was when I saw um, Haudenosaunee people not armed. They didn't even have armor. They didn't have helmets on, mm -hmm. but with their bare fists you know, standing up to challenge and defend their territory. And to me, that just filled me with so much hope and spirit and pride. Like, I can't even describe it. But just, you know, seeing those warriors in those moments, uh, it just, it, it ignited something in me. And, I, and it made me question everything that I had learned, you know, to date. Um, and, you know, us from the East Coast, I mean, we have been dealing with colonization for longer than anyone else. And it really kind of sent me on this journey of, you know, not just the political realm of Native rights and all that other stuff, but yeah. what does it mean to be a warrior? And, mm -hmm. and what is our responsibility to be a warrior? And so I, I'm wondering if you can, you know, talk a little bit about you know, like, what is a warrior society? Is this part of maintaining the teachings and passing it on? Like, what is the significance? Because I don't think people understand what a warrior society is. That's, it's, it's a good question because when we hear those words, I think um, CBC, the government, have definitely given Canadians a, a completely different idea of what it means to be uh, a part of a warrior society. You get the, the impression it's kind of a nefarious criminal institution you get, or, or a bunch of turds, right? Um, but no, it, it's nothing like that. First and foremost, the Warrior Society exists as a collective organization so warriors could fulfill their role to take care of their people and protect the, their territory. That's the first and biggest uh, um, kind of foundational thing that has to happen from there. But beyond that, it's, and I'm going to say the word house, but I don't mean a physical structure. Mm -hmm. House of the mind, house of collective thinking. It's a place where ceremony, ritual, um, norms are maintained. And not just maintained. We go out proactively trying to rebuild the, um, the ways of the world. We are trying to bring back the ceremonies. We're trying to bring back teachings. We're trying to understand the history. So think of this as a, a combination of academic and spiritual research. Mm. Some of our ways of getting back information come from ceremony. You actually go into ceremony with those questions. So for those who've been in ceremony, you know what it means when people ask, you know, you're going to a ceremony and usually you have a question or a concern or something you want to address. For us, we address that a lot like research. We'll go into a ceremony purposely looking for, is there a song? Is there a teaching? <laughs> is there a way of knowing? Is there something that we need to fulfill gaps that were created by assimilation? So think of that as spiritual research, as well as there's academic research and social research. By going to elders and going to community members who are basically like subject matter experts in our ways, we are trying to put together the fragments that, that exist and pull them better into a, a, a stronger sense of knowing what it means to be that warrior. So warrior societies have that role of rebuilding that meaning what it means to be the warrior and a, and a warrior society itself, right? What does it mean to be that collective? Then uh, there's also the idea of uh, 
what does it mean for a worst society to be in a specific territory? What places do they have responsibility to? And have we created the right kind of um, relationships with uh, communities or families that might have a traditional responsibility to say a hunting area or, or a fishing site? Do we have relationships with them that allow us to go in and help if they need help? So there's, a, there's that sense of constant um, building up of relations. And then, of course, we also have the other side, where it is all about the question of resistance. So as a group within a warrior society, there is so much studying, so much sharing going on around. We look at other resistances throughout the world. We'll look at other people that are in conditions of colonization and, and being occupied and look at how they address it. We recognize that we have very different, what's referred to as pre-revolutionary conditions than almost any other nations in the world. If we were in India, if we were in Africa, if we were in Cuba, I think we'd be in a much better position to fight back, just based on population levels, right? We only make up 3% of the population. How do you come up with a strategy that allows you to engage a colonizer when 97% of the population is the oppressor, right? So we have completely different pre-revolutionary conditions. We, there is no indigenous revolutionary doctrine at the moment, particularly in Americas, to be able to take on the colonizer. So little by little we piece these things together and we start to look at how can that be done what strategies work what don't what tactics have we tried that maybe on paper look great but aren't so the warrior society becomes a place that houses teachings lessons learned instructions as well as gives us direction collectively we'll sit and discuss with each other about what our next moves are whether it's to rebuild a ceremony to go out on the land to help somewhere some uh, a community build a hunting society perhaps um, as well as it is the same place, but a collection of people that develop family. Mm -hmm. It really is a family. And what I mean by that is a lot of us have adopted each other's kids by way of ceremony. And that's partly because we are creating, we are creating family as well as it is a defense mechanism. If any of us ever end up hurt in jail or, or worst case are dead, we still have the means to be able to take care of each other's family. Mm -hmm. and so it is a tight, tight network of people that are trying their best to rebuild these indigenous relationships. Well, and that goes back to your point about relationships. And so, you know, even within your own society, you're looking to have relationships and protect one another, which is part of your ultimate warrior value in terms of protecting and, and developing relationships. And I really appreciate, you know, the point that you made too about the work that has to be done to kind of counter colonization in that, you know, warrior societies have to work on building relationships with nations and with um, communities, houses, villages, clans, like it's almost like rebuilding those relationships yeah, so that they feel comfortable allowing warrior societies to help them defend their lands and protect their rights because of colonization and because of how our warriors have been so vilified and and it's not even in our own heads we know that anyone even remotely associated to warrior societies um are monitored surveilled followed reported on actively watched by a whole yeah. host of police rcmp ceases dnd law enforcement you name it i mean even in Never even affairs is in it <laughs> yeah it's true it's true and, and really, that comes back to being indigenous. So the way we approach conflict and resistance is really about, about trying to bring back that value. It, it, when we speak about being indigenous, I know a lot of people say, well, that means ceremony, that means song, that means dance, that means regalia. We, we, we see the surface stuff. But really, to be indigenous, regardless of your, your, your Mi'kmaq or Anishinaabe or Cree, mm -hmm. what it really means is, is putting relationships at the heart of everything we do. Relationships with people, relationships with community, and relationships with the land. Because that's what really defines the idea of being indigenous, is putting these relationships and the responsibilities that emerge from those relationships at the forefront, forefront of every part of our life. So when we talk about engaging in resistance and we talk about relationship building at the same time, it sounds a little strange. At first, some of you may say, oh, you mean allies and, and people that are even going to, you know, will assist you in conflicts. No, I don't just mean that. I mean the real sense of what kind of skills do you have around developing proper relationships with people that you need to have uh, those relationships with? 
and with the land itself. Do you know how to get out on the land and be there long enough to start develop that kind of relationship? And in that relationship, are you in the correct, correct mindset and what we refer to as spirit set? So it's like a framing of the spirit to receive che- teachings, to rebuild ourselves, right? So it is, it really comes down to relationship is resistance. Well, yeah. And you know, uh, everything you say, it just like, I have a thousand questions for you because you, you know, I've just been following your work for so long, but you know, this focus on relationship, because you know how some people will say, you know, superficially, um, around this, this ceremony relates to a relationship to the land, you know, like people who are onlookers are trying to describe what it is that we're doing, but they don't really, really understand what that means. Mm-hmm. And what I really like about the work that you do is you're not just talking about, okay, hey, let's have a relationship with the land in terms of protecting it, because that's like central to our, you know, yes. maintaining our sovereignty in the future. But it's also, can you live on the land? Like, do you have the skills do you have the ability to actually engage in that relationship? It's not just being there. It's yeah. also, can you survive on it? And can, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about why you've put so much focus on your educational efforts to teaching indigenous peoples, like literally all over the world and young people, how to survive on the land. This came a while back. Um, I normally only teach in warrior society groups. And obviously that's because I'm trying to rebuild this side of our our nations. But also we have a lot of principles around our teachings. And one of them was you have to earn your teachings. And what that meant was you had to demonstrate commitment. You had to demonstrate you're going to work, that you're going to put in the necessary effort to get your teachings. Because there's no, you know, like there's there's no formal relationship around this. We think in a a capitalist society, Um, it's not like that. In In a warrior society, you earn your teachings. So we'd followed that principle for so long that we never extended teachings outside the warrior society. But um, I think it was 2012, uh, friends up in Wissotan territory asked me to come up and teach for a little bit. And it, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, at the Wissotan camps, there are a mix of native and non-native. And I was incredibly reluctant because I'm always concerned about cultural appropriation, culture vultures, um, I don't want to arm them with warrior teachings that they can go out and turn it into a workshop and, and make all kinds of money off of, right? So I was very reluctant because I didn't know the audience. But at the same time, I was like, okay, again, we're going to develop relationships, particularly with <clears throat> people engaged in with, uh, with sodium resistance. Maybe this is the way we'll do it. And so I began speaking about things, uh, relationships to land, and began speaking about ideas of words. I didn't talk about details of ceremony. Just definite barrier there, right? We'll talk around the subject. You won't give details and and such, right? Um, But what that did was it opened the door to the idea that if we could use teachings as a form of recruitment, if we could use teachings as a way of addressing assimilation and changing mindsets, um, what teachings can we do? Because a lot of stuff in war society, we still won't teach outside of war society. When I say a lot, like 90% of what what we do, we won't teach outside of war society. But there are some things, and it took a few years of discussing what skill sets can we offer outside of warrior societies that have a dual nature to them. One, mm-hmm. it empowers our people to do something, but it also, like it did for me, plant a seed of doubt. So what we found was survival skills are probably some of the best skills you could do this with. Because we say the word survival skills only because modern society has taught us to say that word. But having been in the military, uh, and having studied a lot of this stuff for a period of time, what you find is modern survival skills are culturally appropriated indigenous skills of living with the land. So when you teach our people survival skills, you're reteaching the skill sets that we use to live on the land. And I remember in the military, a good survival instructor would not only teach you a skill, let's say a trap. Mm-hmm. What they do to try to impress you, to sound like a subject matter expert, is teach you the history of that trap. So you would hear, not only is it a trap, you would hear, this is an Apache leg hold trap. Or this lean-to is really called the Adirondack shelter. So you start finding, wait a minute, there's an indigenous root to all of these skills. So in effect, by teaching survival skills, I'm starting to uh, reintroduce cultural skills of being out on the land. So that becomes a vehicle for me 
to try to get people out on the land and start reconnecting. Once we start reconnecting, we're going to find that value again. Once we start finding the value of that land, it's not hard to make that, that jump to understand why we have to protect that land and start to understand why we have to become mortgage. It's a little bit of a journey and it's done incrementally, but survival skills are the first step. They'll get you back on the land in a way that you can start your relationship, reconnecting and starting that relationship with the land all over again. Now, just let me address that for a sec. Um, I know, again, when we think of indigenous culture, we think of dance, we think of song, we think of drumming, we think of regalia. Um, basically, really, what the state allows us to do, the non-threatening things that the state, mm -hmm. we can be performers mm -hmm. of indigenous culture. But we can't be actors and creators. We can't be participants of real indigenous culture. If it's threatening in any way, then it's a problem. So what I speak about a lot is, yes, we need to do those things. But honestly, our stories, our lessons, our songs mostly come from the teachings that are about relationships to the land. So what we have to do as a core cultural skill is know how to get back out on that land. Those stories will come back to us. Those songs will come back to us. But we have to get on the land to make that happen. So that's why I try to push the idea of these survival skills to get back on the land. It's, it's more than land-based learning, because I feel that that term has been hijacked yeah. a lot outside of an indigenous context. It's more than that. And I don't think there's a real word for it yet. But in effect, what we're talking about is skills to be on your homeland. Because every land produces a different culture. And it produces different skills to live in that land. So, for instance, if I was in a desert, I would need different land-based skills to live in a desert than it would be to live in the Arctic. So, different environments produce different cultures, and those very cultures teach you how to live with that land correctly. So, by beginning, these baby steps of beginning with survival skills on the land, hopefully you'll start to draw people closer to the land and start to get them moving on that journey they need to be on. Well, yeah, and that, that's so critically important given the context that we're in and all of the carrots and pressures that governments and society put on us that, you know, to be successful or to be the good Indian, you know, you have to go down this path. And, you know, they, they end up being the arbiters of what parts of our indigeneity is okay. So throughout history, all parts of our indigeneity has been criminalized and hasn't been okay. But over time, in order not to look so genocidal, they're like, well, you know, okay, maybe some of your songs, maybe some of your dances, but in terms of governing your lands, protecting your lands, defending your lands, yeah, no, you can't do any of that. And self-government, well, you can manage government programs and services from yes. money we give you, but you don't get to make any decisions around national security or national defense or any of those things. So they're literally the arbiter of what's okay. So we can dance, but we can't defend. And what I really like about the fact that, you know, all of these, whether it's individual warriors or warrior societies or whatever word is used in all the different indigenous nations is that we're trying to keep that alive and maintain it and not share it for the whole world. Like I really, I was very happy to hear that you don't share 90% of those teachings, which like you said, culture vultures will swoop in and yeah. it'll be a Hollywood movie or it'll be sold in an Aboriginal awareness training package or dumbed down or, you know, mistaught to our own people. And so I got, but at the same time, you're also sharing really, like, really critical knowledge about how to survive on the land. And not just here, like, you've been, like, you know, all over the world, not just in Canada, but you've been in the US and South America and all of those places. Do you find their struggle similar to ours in terms of, you know, reclaiming these teachings and this, you know, English concept of warrior? Yeah, I, it, it's incredible. Honestly, um, one of the most collective, cohesive experiences we have is, unfortunately, is our, our experience of colonization. And colonization almost follows a template. It didn't matter if it was Spanish colonization mm. or French or British. There's, a, there's very much a template to it. So our experiences are very similar. So what happens is in our fight to rebuild our nations and undo colonization, we're finding we're doing a lot of the same things. We're trying to rebuild governance. We're trying to rebuild what does traditional leadership looks like? Not just being voted in, but what does it mean to develop leaders? 
right, and prepare them for those positions. Um, what does it mean to get back a world that belongs to us, as opposed to um, in a simulated world? So I, I found, you know, I could go into Puerto Rico or Guatemala and, and work with Mayans or Taino, and our experiences becomes the common language. Even when my Spanish is rusty, I can still communicate oppression in such a way that we understand it jointly, right? And I'll give you a good example. Uh, we were in southern Mexico in Zapatista territory. Uh, we snuck in, uh, which we do a great amount of time, sneak into different countries. Um, and we were down there for a few weeks, and we imagined we go to Oventi. It's one of the governing communities. And we sat in front of the governing council. And uh, one of the, the brothers in the Warrior Society knew that the way to communicate this would be visual, and let's show pictures of our shared oppression. And he used, you know, the most iconic picture we could think of in, um, uh, for instance, in Oka, where you had the opposing uh, uh, indigenous warrior offset against the, the Canadian soldier. And then he showed a picture of the Zapatistas, uh, a very similar picture, and he put them side by side. And you could see there was a spark. They looked at it and they were saying, same, 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 same. And we understood that our oppression, our oppressor, and the tactics being used were all the same. Now, the arrival at this, about what do we do and how do we handle it? I'd say Central America is ahead of us. They're more willing to build up groups of resistance. The word warrior isn't used on there. The word warrior is almost seen differently. Like, well, what would translate into Spanish anyway? Um, rarely do you hear the word, traditional word for warrior being used, say by the Mayans. They're using a Spanish word that mostly means like soldier. So it's not seen in a good way, right? Uh, but the older word for warrior in Mayan, you don't hear that much. So when you say it, people are kind of looking at you a little funny, right? But what you hear, though, is a desire and need to protect the people, to be able to protect the land. You still hear this kind of being echoed no matter what indigenous nation you go into. So it became the way in which we can relate to other indigenous nations and other indigenous communities is to speak about our shared oppression and then pass on any lessons we learned. What have we done that was right and what have we done that just utterly failed? So, you know, it may look paper, but no, <laughs> just don't bother trying it, right? And then pass on what we can about strategies and then pass on whatever I got from my academic background or military background and try to help out as best we can. But it, it is that collective experience of colonial oppression that gives us the ability to relate to other nations, even though it is a language barrier. Yeah, and it's not even historical. So we're not even talking about, you know, this collective experience of what happened in the long ago past, but mm -hmm. all the colonization and genocide that continues, the theft, the continue theft and erosion and contamination of our lands and the oppression of peoples and, you know, just and the multiple waves. So not just governments or state actors, but then you've also got transnational corporations, you know, the extractive yes. industry, who have their own security or police forces, who do their own uh, sets of damage, especially in, you know, places like Mexico, Central and South America. I mean, we all know Canadian mining companies are the most lethal in the world and, you know, bring their own security forces. And so I'm, you know, it's, it's reassuring to hear that there are conversations going on back and forth about that because we are inherently challenged and i you know i often think to myself where would we be today in 2020 had our warriors not stood up in any of these times at Eskinobadige, you know at listagush at gunasatage gunawage in wet'suwet'en territory in iprawash like where would we be in our relationship and i think we would be far more oppressed i think things would be markedly different if they didn't know that we actually have power even in small numbers like we have greater power in our small numbers than they do in thousands and thousands yeah. we have the power to impact lots of things across the country what so in solidarity actions showed that and we did it peacefully so that's the other thing that they don't get everything is brute might and violence and oppression for us we can use peace, loves, culture, and ceremony to accomplish our ends very effectively. And, you know, like, I know there's probably no, you know, 
short answer to this, but if you had to think without revealing any strategy, obviously, okay. about what some of the biggest challenges are to warrior societies moving forward, would you think it's, it's more about that there's not enough people passing on the teachings? Is it our, is it our numbers? Like, you know, what, what can we do as Indigenous peoples, without exposing anything, obviously, you know, to kind of help? you know, to share the knowledge about how important it is to uphold these values. I don't know if we can put our finger just on one particular thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a collection of stuff, right? Every day we're in a battle with simulation. So the idea, like I said, uh, whether or not warrior teachings get passed on. The question is, who even has the warrior teachings to pass them on? My experience has been there's so few. And what we do get is this fragments. A couple from some people, maybe another teacher or two from another person. Um, so assimilation has really done a huge amount of damage. Right? So that's part of it. Is how do we collect up these warrior teachings and get them passed on so we understand what it means to be that person protecting the land and protecting the life of that land and the people? Um, that's part of it. There's another part that I think a lot of people don't see because it's more behind the scenes. But as a fight against colonization, uh, perhaps the biggest Achilles heel has been the um, the utilization of Indian uh, chief and council system. That that's an imposed foreign governance. That's not ours. I know so many of our people are politically apathetic. We're, we're so tired of being disempowered that we just don't care about the political realm anymore. But that doesn't mean that the political powers don't care about us. They seek to control us. They seek to occupy our lands. They exercise power over us every single day. And one of the most crucial instruments in colonization is the overthrow of um, a legitimate traditional governance and in the imposition of a government that is responsible to that colonizing power. You see this all over the world. That's why I was saying colonization it, it follows a template, right? And wherever we see a fight, we always see the Indian Act Chief and Council system um, somehow become an, an instructionalist to a grassroots movement to protect the land or an active subversive element trying to come after warrior societies or activists or, or people engaged on the land and actively assisting the government in undermining those um, efforts. So I think, you know, in the last few decades that I looked at this, chief and council system, now I'm not specifically speaking about individual people, there's some good people we have that are stuck in that system as a way of governing. But I mean the system itself. And I find that system to be so undermining the minute we take some kind of resistance, um, whether it is a problem with egos, a problem with jurisdiction, whatever it might be, uh, chief and council systems tend to actively get in the way and actively support the opponent. Right? And in that, it's just, you know, how do you fight your cousin that's in the band office? How do you turn on your, your auntie or your uncle that's in there? How do you do those things when you're trying to fulfill your responsibilities to live? And we had that. Like we, in, in Esternovich during our fight, um, there was a tiny, tiny fraction that was pro-government. And I say tiny, I mean really small. The vast majority of the community really wanted to get out there and protect our fishers. But the ones that were behind the scenes that were pro-government, it was, it was such a hardship to not you know, develop a strategy that engaged them, that took them on as the enemy. To be able to say, listen, you know, you're working for the colonizer and you're making yourself an enemy of the people, but I don't want to have to take you on. You're my cousin or you're my community or you're, you're a relative. So it creates this real hesitation amongst our own people to engage in that way, but it empowers the colonizer to really undermine our... So I really find this has been one of the Achilles heels in, in our fights is the idea of having a foreign governing instrument in our own communities that will uphold their their agenda right? so stimulation is horrible um the idea of indian act chief and council system that's such a barrier and then to be honest with you too we have to be able to separate social ideologies of pacification from traditional values of protecting and defending we don't want to, in a way, see or vilify, as you had said, the idea of self-defense and protecting 
and somehow think, oh, you know, you're just a, a criminal if you do that, or you're a bad person, or you're a terrorist. We don't want that to be the case either. For our people to be able to stand up and actively defend um, their land and their people, that's, a, that's an honorable thing. And we need to acknowledge it as such. And we don't need to um, echo the voices of residential school that would have told us how bad and sinful it is to do that to pacify us. If anything, it's the opposite. My work is about how do we build the warrior spirit, not pacify it. I want our people to be stronger, empowered, more resistant, more defiant. I don't want them to be pacifist and, and cooperate and, and, and look for solutions that will compromise our, our obligations to the land. So it's trying to weed out the idea of pacification versus a noble cause that you're standing on. One of the things when you were talking, I was thinking about how you see in remote areas, or you know, it doesn't even have to be remote areas, but you'll see situations where there might not be a warrior society, there might not be people who've had warrior teachings, but if something bad is happening, and no one is taking action to stop it, you'll literally see three people just say, well, I've got to do something. Strategically, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what the teachings are. I don't know what the ceremonies are. But I'm going to go and put my body in front of this bulldozer and stop this dam because I know it's going to impact our fishing and our hunting ground and hurt our people. And, and, and they do it. So, so to me, you know, these people are using that warrior spirit, even though they don't have the teachings, you know, and it's, and it's this bit about just be going with your gut, going with what you know is right. And, and then from those two or three people who might sit in a construction area for two weeks, no one cares, no one notices. Some people might even ridicule them and say, oh, look, they're wasting their time. And then all of a sudden there's 10 people there. And then there's 20 people there and then there's 30 people there. And then, whoa, now we have an issue. Now we have a uh, resistance and it demands that the government sit up and take notice. And even though maybe none of them are warriors, but they had that warrior spirit, that sense of, I have a responsibility to protect my people, which I think is also something that we should nurture and we should value because like, sometimes it's it's very very young people or you might see that it's all grandmothers and nobody else it's just grandmothers out there or you might see it's you know some women and their babies out there and they're all trying to do what they can in a context of everything being colonized and everything being broken and everything being disjointed. I mean, it would, this would have been easier pre-contact, but we're not, we're in a situation where at like all of the factors that you said. And to me, I find that also gives me a lot of hope because I haven't had the warrior teachings either. And, you know, uh, uh, I didn't have an uncle in my family teaching me these things, so I see a lot of hope in the spirit that's also, that's still very much within us that can be awakened in other people by seeing that and by seeing the outcomes of that. And I mean, what do you think about that? You know, these situations where no training, no military, no background, just I got to do something. You would fit in totally in any conversation we have in a warrior society because these are the things we speak about a lot. You're using a language too that we speak from. Um, so I, I agree, there is an inherent drive to seek justice to the point where we're willing to sacrifice ourselves to, to make this justice happen, right? We may not have the skill sets, we may not have the strategy, we may not have those things right now, but we have the drive, the sense of purpose to go out there and address an injustice that's being done, right? And I agree. I think that doesn't apply to everybody. There are some people that it burns brighter in than others. And these are the people we refer to as clay. What we mean by that is these are the people that are shapeable. You give them the right teachings, the right skills, they can be profoundly powerful more than just in having an emotional reaction and want to see justice. We can help give them uh, uh, skills and, and, and tools to be able to do that, right? So the way we address this, is I believe that our, so many of our people have what we refer to as a fighting spirit, willing to go out and, and put themselves in hardship in, in a really tough way um, 
for the sake of trying to uh, do what they feel is right. The only problem is residential school has taken away the ability to teach what it means to be a warrior. So we have the raw spirit, but we don't have the warrior teachings that tells us how to use that energy, how to use that, that drive and that purpose to go do something that, that should be good and honorable, right? So in absence of those teachings, we're easily misled. Now, I'm going to give you an example. So imagine you have like, all this raw energy. You're tired of seeing oppression. You're tired of seeing your people suffer. You want to do something about it. But you'll have a lot of different avenues, pathways you could go. If you are not, uh, if you don't know much about your culture and your history, well, then you're easily led down the path of becoming a cop, a soldier. And that's what happened to me. Uh, you could even become a gang member. Because at this point, you're, you feel like you're resisting. You're resisting the conditions of poverty. You're resisting the state, the police, you're resisting what you think is oppression. Um, but it's a raw energy that can be di directed and misled, right? But there's still a feeling, and I, I'm, I don't want to speak for every, everybody, obviously, but I sense there's still a feeling of wanting to take on what you see as oppressive and mm -hmm. injustice. And that's what the drive is, right? So if our people, like you said, if this was prior to 1492, that energy would have been developed that energy, that spiritual warrior energy would have been directed and taught and allowed to help them be able to use that energy in a good way. And that's what warrior teachings are all about. So the language around this is how do we help somebody who has that really like raw energy, I just want to get out there and do something, and then start giving them the right kind of ways of thinking about how to do this effectively and in such a way that our ancestors would have done it before, right? And that's the difference for us between this fighting spirit and this warrior spirit. Just the question of did they get the teachings or not? Because that energy is there. Right. Right. And you know, that makes me think too about some of the things that different elders have told me um, when they were on the ground in different places saying that, you know, we've mm -hmm. also been colonized to think that good emotions are happy and mm -hmm. get along and bad emotions are anger and uh, sadness. And so you quell those and just focus on the happy or there's something mentally wrong with you. When in fact, these elders said all of these emotions are not only good, but they're necessary because they have different levels of energy attached to them. And you can direct that energy and some of them like anger, it's a super powerful energy that can increase your adrenaline rate. It can increase your strength. It can do all of these things that you need in a warrior situation, not to hurt somebody, but to actually be able to, you know, walk 20 miles in the woods to go and, you know, protect a community or something like that like that it's all about take harnessing all of those different energies and then redirecting it and focusing it obviously within the filter of those teachings and one of the things you know they said that was so powerful to me that i hadn't really thought about before and they had gone through residential school um and so they said you know all of the pain that we have suffered throughout all of the years and not just residential school, but you know, 60s scoop and foster care and police brutality and all of these things that happen in terms of oppression and genocide is that um, the colonizers have also worked really hard to anesthetize us. So, you know, the doctors are always prescribing mm. like pain medicine for everything. I mean, you stub your toe and they're giving you uh, pain medicine. So there's this like massive wave to you know focus on anesthetizing us so that we don't experience these feelings and then we don't actually have those energies either to put into these things and you know i just keep thinking about that and keep thinking about that and you know what that means and you know that's not to oversimplify things because obviously in different circumstances at different times we all need different kinds of uh help you know whether it's physical or mental or whatever so it's it's not to say that, but it's just to really hear what that elder was saying about energy and then about suppressing our energy and then what impact that might have on how, what we have to direct in places. And then, that, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying about warriors and those teachings. I mean, you know, I don't know those teachings, but to be able to filter your energy 
through teachings and be very focused and targeted and strategic and smart and forethinking, just like our ancestors were. That's got to be, you know, something very powerful for all of us really to work towards, to really kind of reignite that and support that spark in our kids and our grandkids yeah. and in generations coming up. I, I agree. And, you know, I think the way we've been taught in modern society to think about emotions, you know, you, you label some as good and, and the other as bad, very like dichotomous. It's, it's almost a sign of the Christian values, thing, right? And yeah, that's, that's problematic because for us, we don't see it. We see that more complex. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I think when we think of anger, we usually associate anger with fear and hate. It's a driving force behind anger. But what if your love for your people is so powerful when you see them suffer, it creates a righteous anger. Yeah. It creates a sense to want to do something, take action, where you will put yourself in a place of suffering and hardship, uh, potential loss of life or liberty for the sake of alleviating that suffering. Anger doesn't have to be seen as bad. It's what we do with it that matters, right? So if you could take that anger and de deliver it at, an, at a noble cause, at a, to, to do an honorable act and give you that extra boost you need to endure that amount of suffering and hardship you're gonna have to go through, or to give you a little bit of that courage at that very moment when you're trying to face down 50 RCMP and you're thinking, man, I'm going away for 20 years for this. But then you need that little boost of courage and it's that love for your people and not wanting to see them suffer that empowers this, this energy we, we call anger to cause you to go out and be able to do the things you need to do. So we don't see things in like this very linear way of talking about it, right? And, and you're right. Like, I think it was Martin Sedgwick, the psychologist, that spoke about the idea of um, learned hopelessness. And he had done the, the experiments where they put a dog in this, um, I believe it was a steel cage, and randomly shocked the dog. Now, every time they shocked this dog electrically, um, you know, it would do anything any animal would do. It would jump up, it would bark, it would make noise, it would, it would get really restless. But after more and more of these irregular shocks where the dog had no control over it, it just started to curl up in the corner and do nothing. Its emotional reaction to the suffering had just gone to a point where you're desensitized to it. So he went one step further and he opened the, this uh, cage and he shot the dog and the cage didn't, I mean, the dog didn't even bother to leave the cage. It had learned to be hopeless and wouldn't take any action to free itself from its suffering. We are almost at that point. We have normalized colonial oppression and hardship where we're not almost willing to act on it. We need driving forces like a sense of justice, a sense of urgency, a love for your people that outweighs your love for self-preservation. And we need to use things like righteous anger to fuel our drive, fuel our courage, fuel our ability to go out and stand up against overwhelming odds. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that we had this conversation today because as you know, you know, I, I had some questions and uh, you know, I just, I learned so much from this. Um, and it's, you know, always really inspires me to know that people like you are out there. And for most of the time, we're not going to see them in the media. They're not on television shows. They're not winning Order of Canada warriors. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. these are people that are the unsung heroes, but we would be in a very different position if they weren't out there. If we if we didn't have them, like, I can't imagine if tomorrow there were no more warriors, who, who do we call on when we're in a really tough situation? And what I like most about it is that our warriors that we know will protect us no matter what are always doing so with peace and intelligence and culture and love and safety in mind. You know, you see police rolling down the street and that just gives you fear but you see our warriors on the ground and it's like, oh, that's like peace and safety. And I just think everybody needs to appreciate our warriors that way, that no, they're not these radical, I don't even know the names they call them all and, and it doesn't even matter, but that in fact, whether or not we believe in warriors, 
Warriors believe in us, thank goodness. And they haven't given up on us, thank goodness. Uh, and they don't judge us for being in all the colonized ways that we are and that they're always willing to put their life on the line. And I thank you for that. You're from my nation, so that's uh, a very special connection. But I thank you. I thank all of uh, the people in the warrior societies, everyone that you've been a part of, all of the people we won't ever know for very good reasons, um, for all of the work you do. And um, truly, you know, your inspiration for the future. And I thank you for sharing the knowledge that you did share today. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Um, we don't have a chance to really speak in the way we'd like to speak about words. Because as you said, most of the stuff is mm -hmm. it's done behind behind the scenes and there's no like uh, mainstream acknowledgement. And I want to do the same thing you just did. I want to acknowledge that there's a rising, there is a, a, a building of words. In the last 30 years I've been around this, I am seeing more now than I have seen before. And it does the same for me. It provides me with a lot of hope and a lot of inspiration. And without having to say, be able to say names, because obviously mm -hmm. we can't, I do want to acknowledge and honor them. They, they don't get that public acknowledgement. They do this even though not only is there no public acknowledgement, most of the time they're going to be framed as the villain, the troublemaker, and stuff, right? And they still go up, uh, go out and do the actions they do. They're committing or they're waging acts of honor, as we say. And in doing so, they're really bringing back that role. They're bringing back that, those traditional responsibilities. And I really admire them for all their work that they do with this. Because I really believe when we talk about in a much bigger sense, and maybe one day there's something that you and I could speak about, is what does the role of warrior mean in the longer term kind of climate crisis and fight against industrial society and fight for the life of this planet? What does that mean? Um, I think that'd be a big dialogue. But I want to acknowledge those that are now in the infancy of that kind of resistance where we are fighting for the planet mm -hmm. and we're doing so through the framework and the perspectives of that of a warrior. And I admire the people going out and doing that. So thank you for allowing me to have a chance to kind of share some of that with you. And, and, and I'm really glad we had a chance to speak on some of the issues that we ain't going to hear uh, pretty much anywhere else. No, that's for sure. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought up climate change because this is becoming very urgent. We don't even have time to work all this stuff out. Like, thank goodness that there are also warrior societies, whatever the word is in different places in sovereign Hawaii and Samoa and, you know, New Zealand and Australia that ultimately I think they're going to be our hope you know, for the future. And uh, so thank you so much, Walalin, for taking your time uh, to share all of this. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are going to appreciate all of these insights and will probably light sparks in them, probably had this inherent warrior uh, nature in them and will um, help reassure them that this is a good path to be on. This is a righteous path to be on. And uh, it's really good to know that there's warriors out there like you preserving these societies and defending our rights. And thank you to all of the podcast listeners, or if you're watching this on YouTube, for taking the time to listen for native peoples, you know, wherever you are on Turtle Island or South America or in any of the indigenous territories, um, we're all working towards the same goal. And for everybody else, you know, we're sharing these territories together. So your support of um, all of these incredible land protectors and people protectors um, is critically important. So please help share this information, share these words, um, share this podcast and video around with your families and friends and communities. Talk about it, think about it, how it, how it applies in your nation. And uh, keep finding ways that we can reconnect and rebuild our relationships and put all of these teachings and all of these formats that we have to use today because of pandemics or distance or whatever else, put them all together so that we can keep coming together and supporting one another and really overcoming and conquering um, colonization. I mean, there's no more important task than native resistance and resurgence at this moment in time. So thank you. Until next time, keep living a warrior life. Walaliag. Long. <laughs>